thing I never, I never knew about Eric. So I've learned his life story. He has had an amazing life. He was a Secret Service agent before the Carnegie Heroes Fund. And I think it's amazing how, you know, the same idea of researching people's, uh, you know, acts of heroism and looking after them translates. And I think this is going to be a very interesting night. So with that in mind, I'm no Mike Wallace, but. Great to meet Hi, everybody. It's amazing. I, I've managed to keep secrets for many, many years. You give me some apple cider and some snacks, and I start spilling the beans. Uh, but it's been a pleasure, uh, and thank you for having us, Neil. And I'll start with uh, Shalom to greet everyone. Uh, peace. And I think that's appropriate for the our setting where we are uh, to have this conver conversation this evening. And all, But also, before the evening's over, I want to tell you about Andrew Carnegie's 120 year old uh, hero fund. Uh, it is an amazing organization, I agree. Uh, and I love to talk about it and tell the stories of the heroes. But before we're done, I hope I'll convince you that beyond uh, aspirations to present the Carnegie Medal for, for Heroism, even beyond Carnegie's wish that the fund would support heroes and their dependents so they not suffer as a result of that decision to put their life in danger and many times lose their lives for strangers, but also that the Hero Fund in its, um, in, in its, I call it a simple elegance of focusing on an individual action in a moment in time was part of Carnegie's vision for a more peaceful world. Um, so we'll get to that. Hopefully that's where we'll end up and I can convince you of that. But thank you again for having us. So um, I'm gonna kind of follow, but I promise not to, to read uh, verbatim, uh, a very nice PowerPoint presentation that our Director of Communications, Jules Frainer, who's with us here tonight, has put together for this occasion and hopefully will come in handy for future use as well. Um, this is the Carnegie Medal. I also have one here with me that I wanna share and, and, and uh, with those in attendance here uh, in person before we leave. But that's the Carnegie Medal. It's the Carnegie Medal for heroism. And it's what Andrew Carnegie in 1904 envisioned would represent an honoring and a recognition of those in civilian life in the United States and Canada who would risk or lose their lives um, attempting to save or saving the life of another human being. Um, it's North, it considered North America's highest civilian award for heroism. Now, when I got involved about eight years ago, we, we, we deigned to say that. We kind of shied away from making that statement. So more specifically, it's often referred to by others as the highest award for civilian heroism in the United States. We just argue with that sentiment a little less than we used to. And I think it's, it's not a reflection on us, but it's a reflection on the over 10,000 men and women uh, who received the medal as heroes for saving or attempting to save the life of another human being, very often strangers, people they did not know. Um, the requirements for the medal, um, it, an individual man or woman must be a civilian. By civilian, mean, we mean non-active military. Um, civilian is, has kind of wide ranging uh, translations, but our translation in terms of Carnegie's, the founders of the institution, and our practice to this day is that civilians mean those who are not active military. There's a really clear reason for that. Andrew Carnegie felt, now he was a pacifist. He wasn't anti-military. His company actually made some materials that were used in combat by US military forces, but he was a pacifist. He sought his whole life to avoid war, to bring peace among peoples. And so he felt that the military population and those who um, exhibited heroism in a military scheme, um, that, that market was already being served through various military honors. He wanted the equivalent or something very close, that level of honor for people who were not military members, whose heroism did not involve possibly, and in many cases, the taking of a human life. He was interested only in those who would save a life, or sacrifice their own life, uh, complete altruistic behavior, selfless, that if imitated, could lead us on a path to, as we'll explain later, more than just an individual recognition, a more peaceful world, or at least a different way that we look at one another. 
Um, so it must be a civilian, knowingly involuntary risk, death, or serious physical injury to an extraordinary degree. Extraordinary is what we grapple with. That's our standard. And we only award a little over 10% of the cases that are nominated for the Carnegie Medal. So it's a very thorough process of investigation. Most of the cases that are turned down are turned down because there was some responsibility to act and there may not, in our, by our requirements, a person must not have obligation to ask, act in that way or to that extent. Or the act, though heroic in many, many cases, is not extraordinary risk to the rescuer. The risk falls a little bit short. Um, the victim, um, the person that's being attended to by the rescuer, must be in a situation that we call deathly peril, or they may be, they must be at risk of losing their life without intervention. So that has to be seen and understood by the rescuer when they decide to act either from a point of safety, or if they are in the problem, as we say, and they're a potential victim themselves, if they forego the opportunity to flee to safety, if that opportunity is, is uh, available to them. Uh, each res rescue must occur in the United States, Canada, or the nautical waters that surround uh, the North American continent uh, outside of those two countries. Uh, the act must be brought to the attention of the Hero Fund Commission within two years of its occurrence. And um, we get a lot of nominations. We're contacted. Jules handles a lot, lot, a lot of emails that um, endeavor to, you know, nominate an act that happened many, many years ago. And although probably heroic in many cases, we have to live within that two-year time frame. Even within that time frame, as small and as tight as it is, that leaves us with many nominations to look at very thoroughly for a very small staff. Um, there must be conclusive evidence to support that all of those elements, the threat to the victim, the risk undertaken by the rescuer, and the act's very occurrence. We're very thorough in our investigations. We have been since our founding in 1904. Believe it or not, when Carnegie established the Hero Fund, there were a lot of people applauding. What a great thing to do. Um, completely on board with the idea. But there are also a number of naysayers that thought that Carnegie, arguably the richest man in the world at the time, here he goes again. Now he's gonna to try to buy heroes with all his money. So it was very important, it's important to this day to protect the integrity of the award that we can stand behind every Carnegie Medal that's presented. Now the downside is that we know full well, there were many nominated acts and cases that we've handled through these many years that probably deserve the Carnegie Medal, but they were not able, it was not able to be given for that reason just for, for whatever reason, we were not able to gather the facts necessary to fully understand and, and stand behind that, that award that, that was made. Uh, the Hero Fund Commission, again, uh, almost 120 years old. We have 21 commission members. 21 was the number that uh, Andrew Carnegie established. He started with 20, 21 very close confidants, uh, business associates, personal friends, people he trusted. And he entrusted this group of people to put together the commission to do the, the work in the way that he envisioned. Um, and we're going to get to the historical impetus in a moment, but they met very quickly. Um, it was very well coordinated. They had a lot of things to set up. What's the commission going to look like? How's it going to operate? We have to write bylaws. We have to come up with a design for the metal. We have to find someone to manufacture it. How do we investigate these cases? Even, you know, all of the things that we've already talked about. What's the geographic scope? Uh, how do we handle these? And, and setting up really every, each and every protocol um, for this really very large undertaking. And a lot of those things that were put in place at that time are done very similarly today. Now we've evolved, certainly we'll continue to evolve, but those timeless elements that they wove into the fabric way back then are really very much evident um, to us even every day in our work. So uh, that, those are our 21 commission members. They more, meet four times a year. They meet quarterly to consider the cases that are put before them through the hard work of the staff. And we learn about these cases a number of different ways. 
Um, we put out feelers ourselves. We have very long tentacles for people who know about the commission and nominate cases directly. Um, some we don't know. Some have just heard about these acts and bring it to our attention. We love the direct nominations, but we also look at media reporting and we have a clip service that looks at media reporting every day based on certain search criteria. And then we, every day, we look through those clips that come in from media reporting and we try from the very initial steps to have a basic understanding, to build on that understanding, and at every step to compare it against our awarding requirements. One thing I want to be clear on, and we're clear to everybody that we that we um, interact with in these cases, especially those who we have to turn down, we are not in the business of deciding whether or not an act is heroic. We only endeavor to compare it to our very, very narrow awarding requirements. Um, so we want to be a voice and we want to advocate for heroism in all its forms. We want to advocate for the things that were done that fall outside of our title warning requirements. So we present the medal, but we advocate and we appreciate, we celebrate, and we honor all of the heroism that takes place within our sphere uh, and beyond. Um, there are also uh, eight European uh, hero funds uh, out of 10 that were created after the American fund. All but two are still in operation. So we consider them our sister institutions. If you combine that and put all of our that patchwork quilt together, we cover a, a good chunk of the world, excuse me, a chunk of the world, at least in North America and Europe. And so we um, our work goes beyond our shores. Uh, the heroes, most important thing that we do, most important thing we have to share. Uh, these are just some photos of some of the cases that have come to our attention and have been awarded by the commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we deal with more than 10,000, as I've mentioned, uh, has re have received the medal. We deal with about 20 perils to victims and, and then subsequently to rescuers. Uh, everything from drowning, uh, burning, burning vehicles and burning buildings, uh, human assault, animal attack, electrocution, heights, uh, and it goes really on and on from the common to the obscure. And we kind of see it all. And then we have a final category that's kind of general or miscellaneous that captures anything that doesn't fit within those categories. What our work reminds us of every day is the vast array of perils that might confront us. Uh, not to go negative, we come out of this with a positive um, final analysis of hope it stems from the realization that people are still out there that will risk their very lives for people they've never met. But it is a perilous world we live in. We find ourselves in crazy, dangerous situations. But the good news is the person standing next to you uh, might be the, the one you can, you can count on in, in that moment of truth, or we may be that for someone else. Um, ordinary people, as diverse as a group of over 10,000 people can be, What's important, no obligation to act, uh, no training that would pertain directly, experience, safety equipment. But despite all that, um, they endeavor to try. So many drowning cases we deal with where a rescuer has either uh, a very poor swimming ability or you'd be shocked to see how many have no swimming ability at all. They still enter that water to try to save someone. And it's not an exercise in futility. It usually doesn't end well for the rescuer, but often they do just enough that they can save that other life, even if it means their, their, own, their own death. Uh, it's amazing. And that's what we celebrate. Just to go back to one thing from the previous slide, when I said, when I uh, recounted a few minutes ago, our definition of a civilian, non-military, but police, first responders, firemen and others, can qualify for the Carnegie uh, Medal for Heroism, and they're often uh, they're often awarded in in this in these circumstances. We take into account the obligation that first responders have to work in dangerous environments and come to the aid of others. When the circumstance is such that what they do is beyond that expectation, beyond that oath, beyond their training or equipment. Very clear example would be a police officer that runs into a burning building or a fireman who um, interjects himself to save someone who's being assaulted by another human being. So um, they can qualify in a sense they have a slightly different bar, 
uh, a slightly higher bar because their actions must be beyond the obligation of the oath that they've taken. But as diverse as a group can be, 20% um, of Carnegie heroes have died in their act. 20% uh, of our medals historically are presented posthumously to next of kin or the family of a rescuer who, who lost their very life. Um, these are some very important words from Andrew Carnegie. They, they began our deed of trust, which Carnegie wrote in 1904. It gave us written direction of, of that, the fact that the commission was to be established, that he was to endow it and the work that he expected it to do. And it's, it, it, it reads as such, we live in a heroic age, not seldom are we thrilled by deeds of heroism where men or women are injured or lose their lives in attempting to preserve or rescue their fellows, such the heroes of civilization. Andrew Carnegie, very interesting man. Uh, as Neil and I were discussing uh, before we get into the timeline, this, this presentation is not about Andrew Carnegie. We could fill many hours uh, on the subject, but a very interesting man, um, wise beyond his formal education, certainly. Uh, but he, Andrew Carnegie understood many things that served him well in life. Again, obvious, obviously a very successful businessman. He was the king of the steel industry, and he created Carnegie Steel, which ultimately was sold to J.P. Morgan as one large component of U.S. Steel in uh, 1901. So um, very successful businessman. He understood people. Um, but throughout his professional life, Carnegie was torn. He wanted to make money, but he also thought down the road, and this is documented he, uh, from early on in his professional life, his goal was to make as much money as he could, but to give it all away before he died to causes that meant something and causes that would last and endure. And he created many philanthropic organizations. The Hero Fund, I think, is this, it's been often described as this, this special little tiny, beautiful jewel box that he created. Not everybody knows about it. We've gotten the word out quite substantially in recent years, <clears throat> but certainly it's, it's, it's the name recognition doesn't rank with Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Mellon University, Carnegie Corporation of New York. But to him, it was really from his heart. It was really from his soul. And I think it reflects, and there's documentation to this, everything I've seen and read and experienced in my time with the commission, it reflects more of Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, the human being, maybe than any of the others, because he so valued what these heroes do in heroic action and to support those who would make that decision so that they not suffer. Um, so it's a very important little cog in the Carnegie world wheel that still uh, turns. Uh, all independent organizations, but we interact with the rest of them quite a bit. And for all of those reasons, the Euro Fund, the US uh, Fund, and even the European funds are very very well respected within that within that group of institutions. So it all goes back again to 1904. This is our timeline. Uh, Andrew Carnegie founded the Hero Fund. Uh, but again, his interest in heroes was documented to have started well before that. There was a young man who sacrificed, sacrificed his life in 1887. Um, Andrew Carnegie donated money toward a monument to that young man. He lost his life trying to save the life of a friend in a Dunfermline lock in a lake near Carnegie's hometown of Dunfermline. And Carnegie contributed to the marker for William Hunter. He drowned attempting to save that boy. And even before then, there's indications that Carnegie so values human altruism, so values heroism, self-sacrifice. But this is a really important step, a solid step, literally exists in stone and brass, that Carnegie puts on the record that these are the heroes of civilization. These are the people who will not destroy their fellows, but they will save or greatly serve them. And that's the model he wanted to create through individual focus on heroism by those who have no obligation to act and risk themselves. And again, what does that mean? Not only for peace in the world, but how do we look at each other? Do we look at each other as threats, competition, potential trouble? Or do we look at somebody as maybe the only hope that we'll have in a moment in time? Um, and again, th these are his exact words. The true heroes of civilization are those alone who save or greatly serve them. Young Hunter was one of those and deserves an enduring monument. Again, Carnegie had a lot of money. Uh, 
he could give a lot of money away and not feel it. But he gave it away and felt it in this case because there was a lot of what he felt about the most of our better angels and the best parts of humanity within the gift to create this commission and, the, and to, to uh, support its ongoing work. Historically, the, the spark, if you will, um, for Carnegie to put his long discuss, discussed action to create a hero fund type organization, that spark happened on January 25th. 1904. It was a disastrous explosion at the Harwick Mine in Cheswick, just about 10 miles upriver from downtown Pittsburgh. At the time, it was the it was the the the, the biggest and worst uh, mine disaster in the United States. Uh, two rescuers, a man by the name of Daniel Lyle and a man, man by the name of Selwyn Taylor, they heard of the disaster and came from places of safety to try to affect rescue efforts. They both lost their lives in the rescue attempt. So Andrew Carnegie is now in, in, in New York. He's he sold Carnegie Steel. He's going about the full time business of trying to figure out how he's going to give all this vast wealth to institutions that will better the human race. Um, and he writes a letter immediately to a man who would become the first president of the Hero Fund Commission. And we actually have this handwritten letter in the commission offices to this day. And it says, I cannot get the widows and children of the mine out of my head. So it's something that 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 touched Carnegie at a human level, a very human level. And that was the impetus for him to put through this letter and the direction that followed to put the commission together. And so that's January. So now March, he's already drafted and signed our deed of trust, um, witnessed by his wife, uh, Lois Carnegie, um, and very important to the naysayers, those who would say that he's trying to create heroic action. He knows full well you can't create heroic action. It's something within an individual that's going to be impulsive. It's going to be an impulse that they can't resist or ignore, despite what human nature would tell us to run to safety. And he says in Carnegie's words, I do not expect to stimulate or create heroism by this fund, knowing well that heroic action is impulsive. But I do believe that if the hero is injured in his bold temp attempt to serve or save his fellows, he and those dependent upon him should not suffer pecuniarily. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I had to look that word up when I first read that. But Carnegie did not want them to suffer financially. And in those days, <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't have the social safety nets that we have now. If a breadwinner lost their life trying to affect the rescue of a stranger, the family may become what may well become destitute. Um, so Carnegie wanted to support them. So not only recognize through the medal what they had done, but create a support network from the fund that the fund would be endowed to administer itself so that they not suffer. May 24th, 1905, um, the Hero Fund, in setting up its work, approved the first class of Carnegie Medal recipients including the very first Carnegie hero, Louis Bauman Jr., kid from Wilkinsburg. So he was a local kid who, um, as it says, saved Charles Stevick from drowning. It was on July 17th, 1904 in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. He was 17 at the time and the Hero Fund's first hero. Uh, also in that class of heroes, Ernestine F. Atwood, who saved Harry M. Smith from drowning in North Weymouth, Mass., August 22nd, 1904. She also was 17 and the Hero Fund's first female hero. So here we have two teenage heroes in the first class and, uh, and a young woman as well. So uh, in addition, a commission voted to donate $10,000 to the Grover Factory Disaster Relief Fund. So in the deed of trust, it's very clearly stated from Carnegie's um, mind and heart the hero fund should also pay attention to disasters as they happen um, especially where heroic action is present and so through the years you just see some of the examples of the somewhat substantial grants i mean you look at forty nine thousand dollars in 1904 1906 1907 there was a lot of money back then so they were very generous and they were directed to be very generous through the years a lot of them were mine disasters fires explosions You'll also see as this scrolls through the Titanic disaster. The Titanic disaster was to such a scale and such a human tragedy that um, 
you know, you couldn't, and we're sometimes challenged in these situations. It's very challenging to try to recognize, recognize um, an individual um, case of heroism, individual actions in those scenarios, because there's so much going on, it's hard to gather the facts. You don't want to recognize an individual or several individuals, knowing full well that you're, you're missing quite a few as well. So the Hero Fund has also taken significant action in those cases. Titanic, uh, they you know, made, made grants uh, to assist victims uh, and families. They also created a very beautiful monument um, that's now in the Smithsonian Institution down in Washington, D.C., but it's kind of a big marble monument with a mount, uh, mounted Carnegie Medal um, to the victims and to the heroes that were involved in that tragedy. 9-11, uh, another instance, uh, the Hero Fund made several significant grants to funds that had been set up to deal with uh, victims, victims, families, and survivors. Um, most recently, uh, we made a donation in 2019 um, to a fund that had been established to treat, or excuse me, to support um, medical first respond responders, frontline medical personnel who had died as a result of treating COVID patients. And um, it was set up in such a way, it was very well done. We thoroughly vetted it and we felt that they were doing that work much in the same way we would do it ourselves. So it was an extension of our efforts. And um, it, 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 it goes directly along with the guidance contained in our deed of trust for this reason, because Carnegie includes in our deed of trust the statement that the, you know, the, the actions of uh, the voluntary actions of nurses and doctors in times of epidemic should not be go unnoticed. Um, and so we had that kind of direct guidance and we, we look for a proper way to do that. And I think we st struck the, the right uh, note there. So that, that fund, it was called the Brave of Heart Fund. Um, it, it, it went on to provide grants and support, uh, medical and mental health uh, treatments to the, the next of kin of those who had died treating COVID patients. Um, yeah, so six times, believe it or not, Six individuals throughout our 120 year history have actually received the Carnegie Medal for Heroism twice uh, for separate acts. And so we highlight their actions um, in, in, in several different ways. The first one was uh, Henry Nauman. Um, Henry Nauman was a train crossing watchman of Hammond, Indiana. And if you've been to the Midwest, even to this day, those trains go through these communities pretty quickly. We see a lot of train type rescues in that part of the world. But uh, Henry Nauman was struck by trains as he pushed women out of their paths on two different occasions. Um, he was awarded the Carnegie Medal twice uh, over the life, as I said, only six Carnegie heroes and one very recently, um, which I think is spelled out here on our timeline. So John J. O'Neill Sr. is next. And John J. O'Neill worked um, near the docks in New York City. So he was near the water. Both of his rescues were water related. So Nauman and O'Neill are two examples of individuals that, yeah, okay, they happened to work somewhere in proximity to what could present an apparel at some point. But even the fact that something like that happened twice is pretty remarkable. But at least they were in that environment where it was more plausible. Uh, Rudell Stitch was a highly ranked professional boxer from Louisville, Kentucky, and he he uh, he saved two individuals in two separate acts. The second, uh, uh, Rudell lost his life in a drowning incident. Uh, the second award was posthumous. Daniel Elwood Stockwell um, was another two-time recipient of the Carnegie Medal. Charles T. Carbonell Sr. And very recently, was it 2020, Jules? Um, or 21? 21, I believe. Okay. Um, Michael Robert Kaiser was our most recent uh, two-time recipient of the Carnegie Medal. Um, he, had, um, he had rescued an individual from a burning vehicle um, some years before, and then in or around 2019, which led to the 21 award, Michael Robert Kaiser also lost his life uh, trying to extract a semi-trailer truck driver from uh, the cab of his truck in a busy highway uh, at night. Um, and um, both Michael Robert Kaiser 
and the truck driver he was attempting to rescue were struck by another semi that came over a rise um, as they were just at the, the shoulder of the highway and they both lost their lives. Yeah, so 2004 was a really important year for the Hero Fund. Um, it was our centennial celebration. And um, so several things were done. There was a book was published. Uh, there was an event in Pittsburgh. Um, there, there were, was a video produced and it was time for celebration. Uh, in our own time, Jules and mine, um, we had the, the pleasure of a gathering and, and, and uh, putting a gathering together in 2018 to celebrate our 10,000th Carnegie Medal. Um, it was quite an accomplishment. Uh, so we had two individuals, two Carnegie heroes with us that evening, the 10,000th uh, medal recipient and the 10,000th first to symbolize all the heroes that came before and all that we expect will follow. Uh, native Pittsburgher, native son Michael Keaton was our keynote speaker that evening. Um, so hero number 10,000 was Vicki Tillman. And Vicki Tillman was an amazing woman. The gentleman you see standing next to her is the police officer, almost twice her size, I think, uh, who Vicki uh, rescued from an assault by a roadside uh, as the officer struggled with an assailant for control of his firearm. Um, so you're going to see a little bit more about Vicky in a moment, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but there's a great quote, you'll, you'll see it. Vicky said she didn't have time to be afraid, there wasn't enough room. So again, it goes to that impulsive action. Often they can't explain why exactly they did it, but they had no alternative in their mind at that moment. Hero number 10,001, another great individual to represent Carnegie Heroes, his name was Jimmy Rhodes, and we're going to see and hear a little bit more about his rescue as well. And these are, these are Jimmy's words. It's definitely an honor to be part of this group. It's just a legacy that it instills, that it has instilled since 1904, since it came around. There's a lot of heroes before me, and there's a lot to come after me. And that's exactly what we hoped he would symbolize uh, in 2018. So a few facts and figures about the fund. Uh, as I mentioned, we're well over 10,000 medal recipients now, an additional 387 since 2018. The fund has given uh, nearly $45 million in grants and other monetary support. This is a breakdown, won't spend a lot of time on it, but again, I mentioned that around 20 perils that we commonly see, this is just an indication of the most common uh, by number. And you'll see that drowning um, followed by burning uh, of two types, buildings and vehicles, are by far the most prevalent, but it really covers a pretty wide, wide range. Uh, ages of rescuers, again, can't get more diverse in terms of age, gender, background, faith, socioeconomic, you name it. The one thing they have in common is that they acted selflessly and risked their life for another individual. The youngest recipient was seven-year-old Kayla Jean Garrigan, uh, a night a fire broke out in the kitchen of her Wisconsin home. Kayla was asleep in the living room. She woke to the fire as her mother attempted to extinguish the flames and called the fire department. Uh, they rescued a younger child. Kayla then, then rescued a younger child. Kayla went upstairs uh, for her 12 year old brother. Um, the brother and Kayla retreated to the bedroom where he opened a window for their escape. Having lost Kayla in the smoke, the brother jumped through the window to the ground. Firefighters uh, who arrived shortly removed Kayla from the bedroom. She was taken to the hospital where she sadly died of effects of the fire. Uh, young people who sacrifice their lives for other individuals um, are the most, I think to me, uh, some of the most striking types of cases. Then you have the other extreme, our oldest Carnegie Medal recipient. This was only a few years ago. Uh, a woman, 61, and her friend, Fusako Petrus, age 86, a retired clerk. They were walking at dawn on a track when an 18-year-old man approached the woman from behind, grasped her, and struck her in the face. They went to the ground, and the assailant struck the woman again while holding her down and attempted to sexually assault her. Petrus, who was considerably smaller than the assailant, brandished a stick. She struck the assailant and called for him to leave the woman alone. The assailant shifted his attention then to Petrus and began to violently punch and kick her. Petrus did not survive the attack. So again, these are all life and death situations. Lives are very commonly lost. They're always changed through these experiences. So we deal with all of these cases. 
our investigation of the cases, how we, even in the recognition of what was done, we handle them with due sensibility. Um, additional support for heroes and their families, I mentioned it goes beyond the medal and the recognition. Currently, we have a one-time grant that comes with the medal that's $7,500. Every recipient or family receives that. Um, and we also provide additional finance, financial resources to those that, that qualify. The initial grant, I'll just say quickly, it's not meant to be life-changing. It is impactful for the, some of the people that, that receive that along with the medal, but we deal with the most financially in need through other grant programs. We have a great program that's scholarship. We can be very generous with heroes themselves or the children or dependents of, of heroes that are disabled or killed in their act. We also have, we just instituted this a few years ago, which is great. We have an honor cord that those scholars that we've supported through the fund can wear proudly at their commencement um, at their university or school. Uh, we also have death benefits. We pay for funeral expenses and we provide on, on request uh, our Carnegie Hero grave marker. There's a picture of it there. It's fashioned to look similar to a Carnegie medal and that can be put again on a gravestone or urn. Uh, this is really very new within the last six months. We've rolled out some programs and we'll continue to do so to expand our support for those heroes who suffer from non-physical injury as a result of their actions. One thing we came to understand very clearly was that almost universally, many of these individuals, you know, they make a decision in a split second. They only have time to think about it afterwards. So even if they survive the ordeal, they start to think about what could have been the result for their family and especially individuals a stranger. So they, they deal with a lot. And we thought one of the best ways they can begin to heal or deal with whatever they're experiencing is to speak to another hero who's also experienced something similar. So we've now just set up um, a, a peer support program where we simply put them in touch for a conversation. Um, there are other things that we want to do in terms of partnership and research in the PTSD realm to better understand what it is very specifically that this tiny little subset of remarkable human beings experiences. Because we've labeled it for some years PTSD, maybe, I'm sure there's an element of that PTSD in terms of a diagnosis, but if it is, I think there are different types of PTSD and different ancillary things that are going on that's specific to an extreme, dramatic, altruistic rescue of another human being. Uh, disabled and posthumous hero, uh, recipients uh, need based monthly financial support. So for those who qualify uh, and exhibit the financial need, we have we have people that we provide monthly benefits to for support for daily and monthly living expenses. And some of them have been with us. You know, there's a good example. Uh, George Hempel and his family received a monthly stipend for 64 years. Mentioned this on the 60 Minutes piece because we're there with them. Um, what Carnegie wanted us to be, we're there with them on that path uh, after the rescue uh, as a result of what they did. And George Hempel was uh, documented as saying, um, George said not long ago, one thing he was grateful for, we've been able to keep the family farm and you helped us do it. So the work that we do, the support that we provide has made real and lasting impact in people's lives. And that's exactly what Carnegie wanted us to do. So there's a various ways you can learn more about the Hero Fund. I think we wanna share a video. It's not very long. I hope I haven't spoken too long, um, but it, again, it'll give a snapshot. It'll bring back some things that have already been mentioned. And I guess we could finish quickly with maybe question if anyone has questions afterwards. Andrew Carnegie's father sang to the west, to the west, to his son as they sailed over seven weeks from dire times in Scotland to New York and on to Pennsylvania. Eager to help the family's financial situation, 13-year-old Andrew quickly advanced from cotton mill worker to messenger to telegraph operator to a prominent railroad manager by age 24. Tireless, innovative, and a keen investor at the peak of the industrial age, Andrew Carnegie will become the wealthiest self-made man of all time. 
but the man who dies thus rich dies disgraced, reasoned Carnegie, who also pioneered modern philanthropy by donating nearly his entire fortune to establishing institutions for peace, education, culture, science, and the arts. Deeply inspired by heroic acts and a devastating coal mine explosion in 1904, Carnegie would immediately create the Hero Fund Commission. It was such an extraordinary idea that Grandpa Nagy, my great-grandfather, Andrew Carnegie, had. We're here over 100 years after our founding because Andrew Carnegie recognized a constant in the human character, which was the potential for heroic action. This is one of the cases that I did that the board's looking at. She was going to jump off the... Um a bridge over the Hood Canal. As she jumped, he was able to grab a hold of her arms. It's meaningful work, and I think uh, I could probably speak on behalf of all of the members of the staff at the commission that um, it's very much taken to heart. Um, with those two, two sole purposes in mind established by Andrew Carnegie, to recognize heroes and to support them and their dependents so that neither the hero nor their dependents suffer as a result of their selfless act. Everyone who reads these cases wonders to themselves, why did, the, why did the rescuer do it, and would I have done it? And I tell people, don't be in any hurry to find out, because these are truly frightening events. They, they do stay with you, and they come back to you. One of the cases that I thought was so extraordinary, a young boy who was maybe six or seven fell into the river. Another boy, Alec Justin Smith, had the presence of mind, I mean, can you imagine, had the presence of mind to run down the bank of the river, climb onto a boulder, reach out and pop this child 15 feet before the edge, they both would be killed. Some of the heroes and rescues that stick with me are when a very young person puts their life on the line for someone else. I think of Ashley Aldridge, who at only 19 years old, a mother of two young children, responded to assist an elderly gentleman who was caught in his wheelchair on the railroad track. And I think of Kara Larson, who tragically lost her life at 10 years old, rescuing a two-year-old child from a runaway vehicle. Those cases stick with me, and I think always will. Surely the Hero Fund Commission, with the support of so many friends and colleagues, will make presentation of its 10,000th and 10,001st medals. This number is but a fraction of the nominated cases, around 100,000 in the Commission's 114 year history. Despite the obstacles, the danger, the fear, the self-doubt, they did it. Very often for complete strangers. They cared enough to risk all. The Hero Fund Commission remains committed to see that they are recognized and supported, and just as importantly, that their stories are told. Came upon a police officer on the right side. There's something wrong with you. Something going on. That's all said that there was something over the wheel. I got the uh, subject out. He um, snapped. And next thing I know, he's reaching for my gun and he's, he's about to kill me right here on the spot. Nobody knew that I was fighting on the side of the road for my life. She pulls up, you know, I get chills right now thinking about it. Um, the next thing I remember feeling was her hand come across my hand, grabbing hold of his hand and peeling it off of my gun. Didn't have no time to be afraid. It wasn't, it wasn't enough room. Just reach out. Just a minute of your time, it can make a big difference. It can save someone's life. I mean, it was just an average day of work. I didn't know what was, was happening until I looked outside. I noticed a fire extinguisher on the wall, so I grabbed it. I just had this feeling of someone needed to be rescued. It's an inferno. Like you can't. I don't understand how you know, how I'm going to be able to do this. When I initially pulled him out um, and he started rolling, I was like, "He's going to be all right. He's going to make it." Once we got him in the bay and uh, they started working on him to try to revive him, 
I, mean, I was able to walk in and, and I put my hand on his chest and I just uh, just wanted to make sure he was okay. But um, at that point, he had already expired. The pastor was a hero himself, uh, being a Purple Heart recipient. It's definitely an honor to uh, to be a part of this group. Just the legacy that that it instills and that it has instilled since 1904, since it came around. There's there's a lot of a lot of heroes before me, and there's a lot to come after me. And at this time, we'd like to call current new heroes Vicky Tillman and Jimmy Rhodes to receive their kind of recognition by one person of the equality of another. In our country, we tell people that all men are created equal, but every rescue by one of our heroes is a demonstration by action of that principle. My great-grandfather was hugely passionate about what he felt was one of the highest callings of humanity. I, I just wish that he could come back and just see all the good that he has done and that it just continues. I don't think there'll ever be an end to it. The ripple effect of one hero's actions at a single moment in time upon societies across generations has a power that cannot be overstated. Today, so far beyond his time, Andrew Carnegie's legacy inspires a stronger, wiser, and kinder civilization through the heroes we continue to honor. I guess I could raise this up to... Uh... Yeah. Quickly, for those that are on the Zoom call, uh, I brought along with us an exemplar uh, Carnegie Medal. You can see on the front is the outline of Andrew Carnegie, and it notes that this fund was established April 15, 1904. Uh, each Carnegie Medal is a work of art. Uh, it's individual. A die is cast that is then destroyed that completes the back of the medal. So this, this is incomplete in that this cartouche is what we call the rectangular piece, does not bear the details of a rescue action uh, for which the recipient um, is being recognized. So this would be filled in with basic information of uh, time, manner, place, rescuer, and the rescued party. Uh, but very important, and I want to point out, and you see the, the outline of the um, North, most of the North American continent, the United States and Canada, and the seals for both of those two countries, which is the geographic scope. But around the outside uh, of the back of the medal is a verse from the Gospel of John that says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So I think um, I'm often asked, just because I'm available, <laughs> others have been often asked through the years, you know, what, why, why do people do this? Um, it was mentioned, I think, once or twice uh, this evening. Um, and I, I can't answer that uh, either, but I can tell you what I believe. I believe it's just that, what, what exists and what's stated on the back of every medal, that there is a form of human love that we don't necessarily completely understand that compels individuals to act in behalf of a stranger. Um, and I think um, that should all give us hope. So, thank you very much. Sure. Yes, ma'am. How is the vision of the 21 people chosen? So uh, new members are nominated by current members. Um, so, um, you know, most of the, well, there's no term limit. Um, so we've had members that have served in excess of 50 years on the Hero Fund Commission. We have just recently capped full active membership at 75 years of age. 
So at 75, our members are invited to remain involved as emeritus members, but we did that in recent years to create some vacancies. Nobody wants to leave, <laughs> which, is, which is really a wonderful position to be in. But um, the, the members of the commission love the work. They love being part of it. Um, and um, they stick around for as long as they can. But uh, it's really a cross section. We didn't dwell on that slide, but it's really a cross section of, um, Again, wide ranging backgrounds. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have financial uh, advisors, we have um, civic corporate leaders. Um, and it's been that way kind of from the beginning. We have one descendant of Andrew Carnegie that you saw in the video. That's Carnegie's great granddaughter, Linda Hills, is a member of our board. Uh, but they all bring something kind of unique. Um, we have one individual on our board who is not only a former commercial airline pilot, but he's also a flight surgeon. So um, those specific ex fields of expertise come into play from time to time, whether we're looking at you know, with you know airline crashes, air aircraft rescues, uh, and also medical aspects of what we what we uh, investigate. So um, yeah, but they come through nominations of the current members, um, mostly Pittsburgh, very very Pittsburgh centric. But again, Linda Hills is from another state. She lives in Colorado. And recently, again, like most other institutions, we've, we've kind of relaxed our requirements to, to allow more for full participation remotely. Uh, and we were kind of heading in that direction. And then COVID hit, and it was a necessity of life. So we allow for, um, but we strongly, uh, we, we, we also strongly encourage in-person presentation at our meetings in Pittsburgh. Yes. Who are saved in the the Bureau? Do they stay in touch with each other? Sometimes they do. Yeah. And sometimes a medal presentation or another event will bring them together often for the first time since the incident. So they can be very touching experiences. I've been involved with a number, and Jules has as well, of medal presentations where the rescue party, the victim that was saved, is also there. And to see that interaction. Um, it's really an amazing thing. Uh, we've also, from time to time, we are asked to try to help connect people after long periods of time. And sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. It's always in deference to the privacy of the parties involved. But if they're open to getting back together, we've also facilitated that from time to time. Um, it's, it's a unique bond that lasts, you know, a lifetime, two lifetimes at least. Because when you look in the eyes of someone um, who needs you to save their life, and they look back. That's, again, that's it's one moment in time, but it's it's really almost an eternal moment. Um, and, you know, we often say, and I often have said, there's, you know, even in rescues where the rescuer is not able to save the victim, they knew in that moment this, they were not alone. Someone was coming for them. So that makes a difference. It makes a difference to that individual. I know it does. And it makes a difference to families, knowing that somebody was going after their loved one, whether or not they were successful. But there's always an element of success, even when a, that life can't be saved, because, again, of the ripple effect. No, I was saving questions. Oh, <laughs> Yep. So it kind of has a history yeah. of race issues. Yeah. And I was curious, I mean, it was a really interesting situation. Do you feel like the, the, the police department in that community might have changed? Did something happen out of that? I think it did. I think it did. And I think our experience in these, these stories, these realities of these rescues and human interactions, they tell a story that often is quite different from the story that is presented to us in our daily experience through the media, uh, through the news, um, we hear a lot about police community relations, specifically to your question, right? And I, I'm not here to tell you that there weren't, aren't problems that need to be worked on, improvements to be made, but it's usually a pretty bleak picture that we see. We in our work see constantly um, so, you know, citizens that come to the rescue of police officers many police officers that obviously come to the rescue of citizens and the dynamic and the reality and the support for those actions within the community and i think 
<clears throat> again, you know, the news tends to kind of gravitate towards things that are, are a little bit more negative because it captures your attention and instills a little bit more of that fear factor. Everything's falling apart. But I can tell you that human dynamic, that, that individual to individual, and in many cases, it is a police officer and a member of the community, uh, might be, you know, Vicki Tillman, who was a black woman, and the officer she saved was a white man. And at that time, there was a lot going on in terms of police community relations throughout the country. And did she look at him as different from her and therefore not worthy of her potentially losing her life? No, she didn't. She didn't hesitate for a minute. And he owned it completely. He, as a police officer, um, many times her, her size, I think he was like 6'3", you know, and here comes this little black woman to, has to save his life. He could have run the other way after the fact and out of embarrassment and a lot of other things, not wanted anything to do with it. But to his credit, he owned that moment and he credited her for potentially saving his life. And their, their relationship, we got a chance to see it. It just makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, great question. So again, we're very proud of the metal. The metal is, it's a unique, um, it's really a piece of art. We're very proud of the metal. It takes about two to three months to, to produce. So in that period of time, we announce the award, the metal goes into production. When the metal's ready, we hope that there's a presentation. There isn't one in all cases, um, but the commission itself, whether it's myself or another representative, will do as many as we can out of each class. But the geography is daunting. And if if we're presenting almost 80 awards, Carnegie Medals per year, we can't really do them all. So we have programs by which after award decision is made, we also write letters, we correspond with every level of public representative, mayors, um, all, you know, mayors, council men and women, uh, congressmen and women, senators, governors, so that they know their constituent will receive this award. Oftentimes they step up uh, on our behalf and present as our representative. Uh, we also have a great program whereby volunteer Carnegie Medal recipients, so those who have received the Carnegie Medal in the past, in their neck of the woods will present to a new awardee. So um, we do as many as we can. Our goal is really 100% in a hand-to-hand, in-person presentation of that medal. It's that important. Um, it's only in cases where sometimes a presentation um, uh, can't be arranged for whatever reason, or the, the recipient wishes not to have a medal presentation. A lot of moving parts, takes a lot of effort, but we try to make a connection. If not ourselves, somebody will present that medal in person. Oh, are they open to the public? Um, it really runs a very wide range. So, and that's one of the things I like about it. So some of the presentations are very private things, just literally one-on-one -on -one over a meal or just a very private get together, if that's the wish of the recipient. And some are big award presentations, whether it's just for the Carnegie Medal presentation or whether it's made part of some civic celebration of, you know, something larger, uh, whether it's a police officer function um, where we can present a medal at, at that function or whether it runs the gamut, um, it could be very public. Um, so that's kind of what I like. And it's always driven by, um, you know, what, what, the, what the, the person receiving the medal or their family, um, you know, requires and would, you know, prefers. So what brought me in? Um, that's a great question. Uh, Neil and I were talking earlier. I don't think anything happens by accident. And uh, that would be true in my case. And I'm just very blessed to have fallen into this work. Um, coming out of my previous career, uh, I had long been an admirer of the work of the Hero Fund um, from some time, a long time ago. Not really sure the moment, but I would regularly hear about updates and awarding activity. And I just thought, look, this is first off away from my hometown of Pittsburgh all those years. It was Pittsburgh. It was something I believed in. It was Andrew Carnegie, and it had very wide impact. And I thought, wow, how great would it be to do some type of work like that? So um, coming out of my last career, I actually contacted the fund and, 
and they took uh, they took a chance on the likes of me, but it's worked out very well, and it's been great, really fulfilling work. I tell people not to get too much into my previous career. You don't mention it, but you can very easily get bogged down in the in the you know the darker elements of human nature, and the worst activity and actions of human beings, and it can change your perspective as much as you try to fight it. So this was an opportunity, you know, better for me than any good I've ever done for the commission because it changed my perspective and reminded me through, you know, first person interaction that there is still a lot more good in the world than bad. And you have to maintain hope and you have to look at individuals as, uh, you know, as, as equals, as Mark Lasko said, and, you know, the one thing that happens in that moment, that decision that's made, that split second decision by a rescuer to risk their life, they immediately at that point say through their action, as Mark said, that this individual's life is, is as valuable as mine. And that's, if you really think about that, that's, that's, that's the greatest decision that a human being can come to um, in the span of a lifetime at any given moment. So if we can all do that, so I promised you on the front end, I tried to get you all to the point where I'd convince you that this is, uh, this is an element of and work toward Carnegie's vision of a peaceful world. That's the individual model. That's, that's the ideal that we focus on. But if it's in even small ways in our life, if it's exemplified and copied over and over again, the way we address each other, the way we think of each other, what we're willing to sacrifice for one another, the, the, the focus on that person, that person's well-being rather than my own, it would change the world. Um, slowly, shortly, maybe we'll never get there, but Carnegie was a dreamer and we're just happy to carry on that dream. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think many of us feel that that is the goodness in the world, and yeah. it really is very uplifting tonight to see yeah. that that there are people who do really amazing things. Um, and I, I mean, I think tonight is. Help me re 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 still on this what I'm looking for. Re remember that there's a lot of good yeah. people and you've done some really great things. So I think your timing could not have been better. So maybe it's sure. ordained as well that you come here today and tonight because uh, it's, it's yeah. kind of tough lately to feel our, that way. Our hearts go out. And as I said, this should instill some hope. It should lift us up. And um, again, you know, there is always someone else um, who more than empathizes with with tough situations. There are still many who would put themselves in that situation and take on the mantle of the risk that's facing another individual who they don't know and they have no obligation to help. And rather than flee, they'll put themselves and possibly lose their own life. The better, the better angels of our nature are alive and well. You just have to look for it. We find it in these folks. Well, again, I appreciate you coming tonight. It was very fascinating. Really, thank you all. Thank you for, for spending the time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having us. Sure, yeah, and we have some brochures too. Feel free to leave those here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here. Then you hold more. The metal and the long thing. So my kids tell me I'm a technical dinosaur, okay? You can prove that. I'm just going to make a lot of guys. Oh, yeah. Jules, what up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to take a picture. Hey, that's why I keep trying to call it. There you go. Hold on. Can you see the belly where it's. Oh, yes, okay, hold on, I'm going to do it like this.
Chris, can you take the pictures? Yes. They're just yes. on the safe side. <laughs> It does want to work finding this place on your area. GPS. <laughs> We've had people getting lost finding the place. So that's for me. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> you, if you look at the back of the I, they, the back of the probably needs to. 